SummerSlam, the main event, uh, Team Nexus, Team WWE. And uh, did you guys watch that match? Um, and I'm, I'm genuinely not saying this to try and be a, a dick or be smart about it, but I think everybody in this room who watched it and every sort of wrestling fan who watched it knew that Nexus kind of had to win that match. And that's not what happened. John Cena would be the sole sort of survivor of that match. Uh, and um, I just kind of wonder how that came about because it seems a kind of dead set that you guys are on this sort of path of destruction and, you know, there's a, a seven on seven. So it's not even like it's a one-on-one -on -one match with John Cena where he has to lose one-on-one. -on -one. There's so many ways to get out of it. It seemed a, a dead set that you guys were going to win it. Yeah, I agree with you. And um, in the build-up to that match, we had a ton of heat and every crowd we were, were performing in front of um, was just going wild for this Nexus. We had a ton of energy. Every time we went out, we were the biggest badasses on the show. And it wasn't one of those ones where these guys are actually such good heels. They're cool. No, people hated us. and People wanted to see us getting torn apart. And people are bought into this storyline, which in this day and age with how exposed wrestling is and how much everybody's already seen everything a hundred times already, it was a very unique piece of magic in a bottle that we, we'd captured there. And we knew that this being our first test as these rookies who were treated like idiots on NXT who are now running roughshod over the WWE, this being our first major test, we knew we had to win this. And um, it, there was no doubt in our mind. And in fact, a week before SummerSlam, we did the go home Raw, and when the, I think we were in Sacramento at the time, big angle, crowds going nuts, and Arn Anderson came to us and said, hey, the, the plan is next week, SummerSlam, you guys are going to be going over, we need to thrash out the details, figure out how it's going to happen, but you guys will be up. And, you know, we weren't surprised, it confirmed what we were suspecting. So, we went home, came back the next week, turned up at the arena for SummerSlam, we get there, the seven, seven of us rookies at this point, because Daniel Bryan had been fired, obviously, for the, the tie choking incident um we went down to the ring we we're in our suits edge and edge and jericho who were two of our opponents that night um were down there and they were saying hey we're just trying to figure out how to make you guys look like stars tonight so we had a bit of a laugh about it and they were working on putting the match together we went to catering had a little food came back about an hour later and Arn anderson had come out and he was the agent for the match and um he just had a meeting with vince pulls us all to one side pulls the seven opponents to one side it says, okay, guys, here's how it's going to work. We're going to have this guy beat this guy. This guy beat this guy. You're going to eliminate him. He's going to eliminate you. And slowly but surely, we whittled the match down from seven on seven down to two on one. It was myself and Justin Gabriel left on the Nexus side and John Cena left on the WWE side. So um, at this point, Arn says, and at this juncture, John is going to beat Justin Gabriel. And then Wade, he's going to tap you out. John Cena is the winner. And we were in shock. And I thought at first, Arn is just joking to test us. And then I realized he wasn't. So I said, uh, pulled Arn to one side. Hey, Arn, what's the deal? I thought we were going over here. And Arn said, this isn't a me call. This is a Vince McMahon call. You're going to have to go and speak to him. So trying to find Vince McMahon on any day is tough. He's, um, he's a wanted man everywhere. He's got producers wanting him, writers. Kevin Dunn wants to speak to him. Every wrestler on the roster wants to speak to him about a new idea, a new pitch, or this, that, and the other. So... Eventually, an hour or two later, we track him down, and myself and a couple of guys go and see him, and uh, we say, hey, Vince, what's the deal? We're, we really need to win this match. This is, doesn't make sense. We're Nexus. We're new guys. We need this for credibility. We need to go over here. With this This will kill us. And Vince looked me in the eye, and he said, Wade, I agree with what you're saying, but this is SummerSlam, and SummerSlam needs to have a happy ending. And I thought to myself at that moment in time that that was bull It was a bull answer. I knew it was a bull answer, but we were in a position where we were new guys and we had no leverage. There was nothing we could do about it. We, could, we weren't going to threaten to walk out and refuse to do it. Vince made his decision. He gave me his explanation. I thought it was nonsense. I think it's nonsense now. Why he came up with that, I don't know, but I knew I was being lied to. So later on that day, we spoke to John Cena too. He reiterated the message from Vince that SummerSlam needs to have a happy ending. The kids need to go ha home happy. I thought it was then. I think it's now. It was a bad decision, and uh, and that's how we did it. And, um, yeah, so unfortunately Nexus lost that, and I don't think we ever really, despite the efforts of the creative team and the, the writers and the producers, I don't think we ever got back to that level that we were prior to losing that match. <laughs> Thank you.
and I think of all the tours we've ever done, and I'm not just saying because you're on stage, but like there's so many like Wade Barrett t-shirts here tonight, whether it's a Bad News Barrett t-shirt or a King Barrett t-shirt, or there's like there's Barrett football tops on over here. Um, so you know, t-shirts were a big part of your career. And one thing that's always kind of baffled me was when after SummerSlam, one of the big angles they did was John Cena joined Nexus. But he didn't wait, you know, like in 98 when Steve Austin pretended he was going to go corporate to Vince McMahon, he wore the full suit and then he took it off or whatever. But when John Cena joined Nexus, he didn't wear the Nexus t-shirt. He still wore the Barney the Dinosaur purple, <laughs> which nobody at our shows has ever worn. I don't know what testament that is to us or not, but... Um, so why, it just seemed like a dead start. John Cena, a guy who, like, when he's, when, when John Cena's having top matches, there is arguably nobody better than him in some ways. Like, he is a great wrestler, like, contrary to some people who don't like that opinion. But why did, why did he not commit to that, do you think? So John Cena ended up joining Nexus. Um, I can't remember exactly how we got there, but he had to join Nexus. And part of the thing about Nexus was we were an army. We all wore the same uniform. We had the yellow N. And, and what is an incredibly basic, simple T-shirt that normally shouldn't be popular looked so imposing because you had an army of people, almost like drones, wearing the same top. So for John Cena to have joined Nexus and not wear our shirt, there was something not right. And viewers pick up on that, and it... it it doesn't help the storyline when you have something that doesn't make sense like that and not explained. So here's why that happened. So um, obviously we wanted John to wear the T-shirt for storyline purposes. Now, your standard WWE contract, and when I talk about standard contract, I'm talking about 90% of the wrestlers that you see on TV. Um, you get a merchandising deal within the contract, and every T-shirt that is sold that has my likeness on there or my name or Bad News Barrett, whatever it is, I get 5% of the proceeds from the sale of that shirt. So let's say you paid £20 for that shirt. I would get £1 of that coming to me. £19 will go to WWE um, to go for their manufacturing or their marketing and their profits um, and that kind of thing. So I would get just 5%. Now, someone like John Cena or someone who's higher up on the roster, they have a bit more leverage because of the amount of shirts they sell or the amount of times they amount of time they've been there they get to negotiate contracts where they get a much higher percentage than five percent so i don't know what john's was let's speculate and say he got 30 percent of all his t-shirts these old so he's already getting a higher percentage than we are on the the nexus shirts now the problem with our nexus shirts that five percent wasn't going to me that five percent was then getting split seven ways between all of the guys within the nexus so Rather than me getting a pound for every Nexus shirt that is sold, it's now getting cut down to 12 or 13 pence for every Nexus shirt that's sold. It's going to me, that's going to Tarver, that's going to David Otunga, that's going to Gabriel Slayer, everyone else on the Nexus. Now, if John was to suddenly stop wearing his shirts, not only would people not be buying his shirts, but people would also start buying the Nexus one who want to support John Cena. And John wouldn't be getting a 30% cut. He'd have to split whatever cut he gets with seven other wrestlers. So he's essentially getting only one eighth of the cut for each shirt. So it was a, a merchandising money thing and nothing could ever be figured out about it. And that is the reason why John was never wearing a Nexus shirt. It was a purely a money thing. So, and I would like to point out, I've never heard that story from John, but people within the merchandising team explained how it had happened to me and, and why that was happening. So uh, that's my understanding of why John never wore the Nexus shirt. 